Hi guys, it's Kim, aka Spice Stitcher on Instagram, and I am back again with another weekly cross stitching update. This is video number 89, and today is the 5th of October 2020. I hope everybody had a good week, and let's talk about some stitching. Um, I worked on three different pieces this week, uh, which included more of Witchy Tea Time. I have out of the 2014 Just Cross Stitch. Uh, Halloween edition. It's by Primitive Hair. You can get it on its own now. Um, so that is the design. And when I showed it to you last week, I had the entire top done in this first witch. Um, her hat down to the orange uh, stripe on her hat. So since then, I have put in 1,900 more stitches. So I've got uh, 2,900 stitches done in the month of September on it. And there we go. This is 32 count Belfast in uh, Salem by Color and Cotton. Here's the fabric. Um, I did sub in my own orange and green colors on this one. And as I told you, I changed the coloring and the letters to make it all black. So now I have one witch complete with her broom in the uh, beginnings of the table. And my 2020 goal on this one was half of the design. So I think uh, one more rotation on this will uh, easily see me to that goal being achieved. So I'm happy about that. So that is Witchy Tea Time by The Primitive Hair. And so I worked on that through the end of September. Come 1 October, I had two pieces to work on. The first is uh, the Classroom of... Classroom. Catalog of Witches Familiar, Stitch Along by Ingleside Imaginarium on Etsy. Links below to her um, shop and to this listing. So there we are. There is the entire piece so far. We only have two more months left and the October familiar is Chiroptera or what looks like a normal bat. Now Brittany chose this specifically for October because of Halloween and because of all the legends that say that the planes between worlds or the veils between worlds um, become thinner around Halloween. So uh, any witch who has a Chiroptera uh, familiar can use his echolocation to locate those thinner spots and protect his witch from accidentally stumbling into them. Or if she's looking for them on purpose, he can locate them for her. So that is a close-up of a bat. Um, it was a lot of stitches. I understand why Brittany had to do it to get the, the detail um, for his, his face and his body, but that's a lot of black. Um, so he took two full days to stitch, and that was 1,300 stitches just in the bat alone. So we only have two blocks left. I really don't know what animals are next, but I'm looking forward to finding out. And the fabric is 32 count Lugana in Murky uh, by Picture This Plus. And then also on 1 October, I started my first Out of the Stash at Last piece. Um, which I told you was going to be the Greyhound QS Wizard 4 by Stephen Paul Carlson of Hade. So this is a non-full coverage Hade using only 14 colors. And um, so what I did is I started gridding from the center middle and I got over here since this is um, the right edge of the piece. And I gridded far enough so that I could get um, his head in. So I still need to do some more gridding to um, be the width of his body. But, and I thought that this was going to be 25 count Lugana because back in the day when I was uh, kidding up Friends Forever and O oh Baby and Sunday Delight, um, I know I cut those three pieces from the same piece of fabric, a, a yard of 25 count. And I thought that this may have been squeezed in there too. So I thought it was Lugana. But as soon as I pulled it out of the project bag, and touched it and felt it. This is not Lugana. It's not floppy. It's it's uh, stiffer. It's got more body to it. So this is actually kitted up in 28 count Monaco um, because 
back when I we were in Nebraska, I bought a 10-yard bolt of Monaco um, from Joanne's online back when you could still do it. And I don't think you can get a 10-yard bolt anymore. And I kitted up a lot of items. So this is 28 count, 2 over 1, 10 stitch. And I have 2,410 stitches so far. Since I started him on the 1st of October, I'm not working on it every day. Um, just a little bit here and there. And um, again, so this is gridded all the way. That's as far as it goes. But I need to do a little more this way. It will be enough to fit in the width of the Q-snap. So I'll be able to access the entire piece until I need to move down um, probably a little bit to, to work on his legs. So um, this Greyhound needle minder was from my stitching friend in Colorado. Um, she knew I had this piece. She, she bought it for me years ago. She actually got me two of them. Um, and she, she knows my love of Greyhounds and she knew I had this piece. So of course it had to go on. Uh, Mr. Wizard here. So I have eight of 14 colors done in his head and neck so far. I'm working on the ninth color. Um, the remaining colors, most of them are lighter colors um, for the contrast and can get start to get his brindle pattern showing up. And then there's one darker color. So I will put uh, a few lengths of thread in this every day through Wednesday. Post my ending picture for out of the stash at last hashtag on Instagram before I start my next piece on Thursday. So those are the three, three pieces I worked on. Plans again. I'm gonna work more on Wizard. Um, I might pull out Templar. I've got a really weird week coming up. Uh, more on that later. But um, so Wizard. My next. Where did I put it? My next out of the stash at last piece is going to be more witches. So this is witches by Oberlin Samplers. Um, I bought this one off stash on load, but if you're looking for Oberlin Sampler pieces, again, they mostly do states and locations. Um, but go to my link down below for welcome stitchery. Um, it's for the page for this designer. And so you can see all their designs. Again, it's a hand drawn chart. They're old. Um, but I like them and I will be working on, uh, I think it's 28 count. It's a linen eek by picture this plus, uh, just a remnant I had left, um, from a dragon piece that I made for my daughter. So that will be my start this year, start this week that you'll see, um, in my video next week. Uh, <clears throat> and last week I told you. For full coverage, fanatics around the world were visiting Russia, and I told you why I'm going to be using Card Sharp by Omar Rian because of the uh, ban on playing cards in Russia. This is a piece I started this year, so I only have about 2,600 stitches into it. So it needs to get some more attention, but it does not have a goal for this year because I started it this year. So um, this is my starting point for the month. Now, I do have um, a park started on this one. I think it's Shenandoah. It's either Shenandoah or it's Sequoia. Um, so I have to make the decision to either proceed and try to get the page finished so I can get the park done, or if I'm going to um, restart that park on a different piece um, for the rest of the month because of what's going on in full coverage fanatics in November. Um, <clears throat> Ian posted our November month-long event, which will be Wheel of Fortune. Now you saw this on the schedule for 2021, and so of course we're gonna. Sorry, there's flying cardboard right being blown by the window. Um, you saw it on the schedule for 2021, so we're gonna try it first here in 2020 for the month of November. It does have some. Um, customization that you can make to it depending for both options both counting and non-counting options so <clears throat> for non-counting options you will be matching your um your width or your new start to the theme of the words now there's several words to choose from you can choose between northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere words or you can choose um I forgot 
what she called it was a, uh, the holiday words. So choose whatever, whatever fits and it's not counting. So you just have to fit the theme of the word and you can work on as many themes as you want with as many widths as you want for that non counting option. For the counting option, again, you choose one of those lists of words or, or you can start with one. And if you make your way, depending on <clears throat> your next choice, you might be able to make your way through a lot of them. Um, but, so I chose the Northern Hemisphere word so I can work on autumn, winter, pumpkins, harvest, and I forgot what the other words are. Um, so I'm gonna start with autumn because I like to ch challenge myself to fit the theme and do the counting. So I will be working on trick or treat come November because Halloween will be over, it'll come off the wall um, and back on my scroll frame and I wanna start filling in a page. And so Trick or Treat is an autumn piece because it's Halloween. And then for the counting, you can pick whether, because it's Wheel of Fortune, is one letter going to cost you 50 stitches, 250 stitches, or 500 stitches per letter? It's completely up to you. Do you want to try to get as many words as possible? Or do you want to try to um, restrict it to only a couple words and just do 500 stitches per letter? Choices, choices. The options are endless. And <clears throat> it's one whip per word. So I can stitch on trick or treat for autumn. And if I get close enough to finishing a partial page there, I can pick another whip to do another word. So one whip per word. And you don't have to take pictures for every letter, just every word. So if you get 50, if you go for the 50 stitches per letter, you're not having to take a picture every 50 stitches just for the start of the word and the end of the word. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit easier that way because taking a picture every 50 stitches is a lot more inconvenient than taking a picture for 300 if you're doing it for the entire word. Um, so that is Wheel of Fortune. And because I'm work, going to be working on trick or treat, depending on how many stitches I do, I may use that for one of my parks instead of card sharp, since trick or treat still has a goal left to reach. I wanted to finish all the black and do a partial page down at the bottom. Um, and maybe I might do several partial because the partial pages are pretty small. So I might do a couple partial pages and use that as a park instead of card sharp. I'll still work on card sharp but I won't be um, pushed to get that 8,000 done. Let's see, what other stitching content do I have? Full cover stitches that I have done year to date. I have not been keeping this updated in my own book or letting you guys know for several months now. Um, so I wanted to total everything up and, and see how much I've gotten done. Now I know I've, I've been meeting page finish goals and things, but I wanted to know in terms of stitches, how many stitches I've gotten done. Um, my tent stitch pieces, which are all my Hades and my Tilton, um, and then the Mystic stitch piece. This is through the end of September. So January through September, nine months, 169,000 tent stitches. So divide that by two to get it into full stitches, 84,500. My two uh, full cross stitch pieces, um, a Summer Ball and Macintosh Mill, which are not tent stitch. 24,000 stitches. So add those up, 108,500 stitches in full coverage pieces so far this year. Um, and I do this to help me, which will be in a different video, to help me set goals for the next year. I want to know not only in terms of page finishes that I've gotten done, but this is the first year that I've actually tracked how many stitches so then I can say, all right, average 8,000 stitches a page, and I can divide that. Um, again, I'll talk about this more in a different goal setting video because I've had a request on how to set um, SMART goals for your pieces. So you can do 100,000 stitches divided by 8,000 for your number of pages, or you can, yeah, we'll talk about it later. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole right now. Okay. That is all my stitching content. If that's all you're interested in, thank you for joining me. 
um, and your comments, your likes, everything like that. I appreciate you. Um, now for some quick life updates and then um, Air Force information. It's not really a story. Information. So life updates. Uh, my daughter, my youngest daughter, my five-year-old is home right now. She will be home this week um, here in the state of North Dakota. <coughs> they, um, the way that they're handling COVID uh, positive cases, it differs between on base and off base. Off base is a little more lenient. On base, we're more strict because our public public health office on base is following CDC guidelines uh, for the most part. And so what that means is if someone, for the kids that are not distance learning, they're actually attending school as normal, wearing their mask, um, and the only time they take off their mask is for meals, and um, I think they're taking it off for PE and recess. Um, but my daughters wear a face shield during, during PE. They have a face shield to wear during uh, music class before my oldest daughter because she's going to learn how to play the recorder at some point. Um, so anyways, they're, they're still wearing masks. If someone in the class tests positive for COVID here on base, there's two elementary schools and a middle school that belong to the school district downtown. <clears throat> If someone here on base in that class tests positive, the entire class switches to distance learning and is quarantined at home for two weeks. However, although if that child has siblings and so my youngest daughter is now quarantined at home two weeks, <coughs> excuse me, I should specify two weeks from the date of contact, not the date of when they got the positive result, but the date of contact. Um, so my oldest daughter, who's in third grade, is still allowed to go to school, still allowed to socialize. You know, this is according to the public health office. What we're doing here in the neighborhood is yes, we're sending the siblings to school. However, when they get home, if they go play outside, they are not going to play with any of the kids in the neighborhood. They will only be playing with their siblings and staying in the in their yard um, just to restrict it some more because we now have a couple classes um, in our elementary school that have been quarantined. They don't tell you who the positive was, but it was easy in this case for us to determine because they only quarantined her for a week. Um, they called us Friday after lunch and she's quarantined through... Friday and can then uh, go other places and that is because her teacher has been absent was absent all week last week so it's got to be the teacher because there was only one other student that was absent um, on Friday so it's got to be the teacher that has it and it's not she's she's actually a long-term sub because her actual teacher has been on a medical leave for a different health issue um, Hold on just a second. Someone's trying to come in. Okay, so I forgot where I was. It's the teacher. Um, she's actually a long-term sub because her actual teacher uh, has, is on medical leave and has been since the summer, actually, um, for a, a non-COVID-related health issue. Um, so the date of contact was the 25th of September. So that's why she's only quarantined through October 9th, which is this, fr <coughs> this Friday. Uh, Public Health Office has said that if the child has gone seven to 10 days with zero symptoms, um, the COVID test is optional. And my daughter, she's happy, chipper as can be, absolutely zero symptoms whatsoever. So I'm not gonna test her, she's five. That would be a traumatic, you know, swab the brain um, and I will keep an eye on her the rest of this week and if she does develop any symptoms then I'll test her but at this point it's already been 10 days and so the test is optional um, so she's home doing distance learning doing worksheets with me she is not on uh, zoom or any sort like she's not doing school on the computer she's doing worksheets that we're gonna turn back in um, I prefer that much more than <clears throat> than uh, doing the, the Zoom 
trying to conduct a class through a computer screen. The other life update, if you have been watching my videos for a while, back in March when my husband was still deployed, on the same day we got the information that his deployment would be delayed, or extended rather, because of COVID. And um, that was the bad news. The good news was that his promotion recommendation form had come through and despite his chances of being promoted were slim to none because he was past the um, ideal promotion zone, um, he received a definitely promote on his promotion recommendation form, which is almost always, like it's a 99% chance that you're going to be promoted then if you get that definitely promote because wing commanders only have like one or two to give out. Um, <clears throat> The board, the promotion board met in May, and it has taken this long for um, the results, their, their list of um, people to be approved through the air staff, so through the Pentagon, Department of the Air Force, through that air staff. Um, and I think they were pushing it because last year's board, the list was released in June. And October 1st, so they, they divide that list. Each person is given a line number. This is also for enlisted troops. Um, and so it's not everyone promoting at the same time. They'll say line numbers 1 through 250. You're going to promote 1 July. 250 to 500, you're going to promote um, 1 August. So it's like that throughout the year. And there was um, 1,250 uh, people selected last year. Well, that last person that had the line number 1250 whatever promoted on 1 October. So come 1 November, they have no one left to promote. So they really squeezed those uh, promotion list from this year through really quickly so they could get the public release is tomorrow um, because they're going to need to determine their monthly increments for for this board so they have people to promote come 1 November and it's staggered like this because as people retire they have other people promoting up the ranks <clears throat> so that's why it's not all instantaneous they only have so many jobs for lieutenant colonels and so many jobs for majors so it's a stair step we got to fill these ranks these are epaulets for service dress my husband uh, was selected for promotion so this makes him an 05 select or lieutenant colonel select, which is still a major until his line number gets called to pin on. Um, he does have a, a lower number because he is such an old major because he has passed that ideal promotion zone. Um, so once the public, public release is tomorrow, I hope that they update their monthly increments for November and December because they load up a quarter at a time and will able if his line number isn't in November, December, we'll be able to use those to estimate um, when he'll pin on. But it's going to be, I'm guessing, within three or four months. Um, so that is really good news. It's a pat on the back. It's a reward for job well done. You know, overdue promotion. So <clears throat> it's really good news for us. Um, and they told him on Friday, they told him early because of... Um, something really cool he's doing this week and he won't be around tomorrow. So that's why they told him early. Plus the wing commander here worked with my husband. Um, hold on, stand by. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, he sent me a message and I absolutely had to reply because you'll find out later. Um, so he has a low promotion zone or promote or a line number. I predict in the next few months he'll be pinning on. So that was really good news. Um, it means that all the good work that you've been doing has been recognized kind of thing. So <clears throat> now, um, a few minutes of Air Force information. First, some, some uh, clarification. A couple of videos ago in video number 84, when I told the Air Force story of the B-52s flying out of RAF Fairford, flying over the Black Sea where they got intercepted by um, Russian fighters who were trying to harass and intimidate them, um, flying at their wings and then crossing in front of the nose of the B-52 with their afterburners on and creating um, turbulence. And I told you there was video of it um, that had been up 
uploaded to YouTube and that air crew member was going to get in trouble. Um, found out more information. It was not the air crew member. So what happens on some of these long flights, um, some of the things if you watch my Instagram stories, you'll see or um, certain things I've, sh I've shown here in the Air Force stories, videos of, you know, planes refueling, or like really cool shots and um, aerial shots of planes flying out the window. We get those pictures because when um, really cool things are happening, the public affairs office on base will issue cameras to the air crew members to take pictures and video during the flight. So um, pictures and video of of them aerial refueling, like from the B-52 point of view, and then the refueler probably has another camera. And these are the things that you end up seeing on social media for that particular base, for that particular major command, um, things like that. So it's, it's recruiting information, but at the same time, if something else happens of note, it can also be used for intel. So um, that's why the air crew was carrying a camera. It wasn't just someone pulling out their cell phone. And what happened was it wasn't the air crew that uploaded that video. It was the public affairs folks that uploaded that video to YouTube um, when it shouldn't have been. So that's what happened there. And while we're talking about long flights and uh, really interesting flights, some of the things the air crew members do while preparing and on a, on a long flight, um, some of this is for all different airframes. Um, some of it will change a little bit depending if you're talking about a fighter, a cargo aircraft, or a bomber. Um, <clears throat> so if you're an air crew member, what you take in your medical condition is very strictly tracked. Um, there's just some medica medications you cannot take unless you get special permission. Um, and certain things they will not give you un unless they have it all tracked and, tracked and stuff. So. If you're going on a long flight, they will issue you a few pills that um, are in vernacular called go pills and no go pills. As it sounds, one's a downer and one's an upper. Um, the, the no go pill is your basic ambient to make you fall asleep. So this is if you're about to take a, a flight, an important flight that's um, not just like a short flight. We're talking a longer flight that's taking off at a weird hour, like not the beginning of the day, not when you're normally awake. They will issue you one or two no-go pills so that you can um, stay up late and um, take your Ambien and get your eight hours of sleep before you wake up at an unusual hour and do your flight. And then during the flight, you have a certain number of go pills, uh, which are dexedrine, I didn't research off enough about it to see if it had a different name um, to keep you going during that flight. Now, um, fighters and bombers, there is no coffee machine on the airplane. Okay, so those people that are used to caffeine, they're going to be taking some energy drinks of some sort with them because even though you have the go pills to keep you going, the go pills don't have the caffeine to keep you um, keep your headaches away from your your caffeine addic addiction. So um, the air crew members will take some um, energy drinks or, you know, like, like a Starbucks, you know, bottle drink of some sort either. Um, <clears throat> they will take baby wipes so they can wash their face. Depending on how long the flight is, they might want to clean up a little bit. And um, cargo airplanes have full bathrooms like you see on commercial flights. Obviously, fighter aircraft and bombers do not. There's just not enough space. Um, and also, the baby wipes have a second purpose. Um, the air crew members will take a modium to try to prevent the need to go to the bathroom. Um, because, again, there's either no space or there's not a real bathroom on the plane. Fighters, obviously, no bathroom on the, on the plane. Um, they can pee in a bottle. And I have something to show you for the, for the, female, the female air crew members. Um, on the bomber, still not a bathroom. They have a bucket with a bag, okay, which happens to be right behind my husband's seat. Um, for these long flights, depending on the flight, depending on the duration of the flight, they will have ex extra crew members 
Um, BT-2 normally has pilot, co-pilot, uh, two weapon system officers, which are your navigators, they're the offense, and an electronic warfare officer, which is your defense. Um, and some of those positions will, be, will have extra people, and there's only six ejection seats on the B-52. The rest of the people are sitting in jump seats. On a commercial flight, when you see the flight attendants fold down a seat for um, takeoff and landing, that's a jump seat. Not comfortable, but it's what you got. B-52 has um, one um, one bed, it's not really bed, it's a shelf, to lay on for, to take naps. Um, they do have an oven, it's about this big, and instead of everybody bringing them um, so many meals, they will bring a meal to share. My husband likes to bring um, fixings to make um, English muffin pizzas. So toast the English muffins, put on your sauce and your cheese and your pepperoni, and you've got English muffin English muffin pizzas for the entire crew. So everybody brings a meal. It makes it easier for just one person, to, um, each person to bring one meal's worth plus a few snacks, um, <clears throat> plus their, their caffeine drinks, water, and such. So that's what it's like to fly on a long flight. Um, I hope to tell you more about this this week. It's a really weird week coming up um, later. But in the meantime, happy stitching, and we'll see you next week, guys. Bye.